taxonomy is the uh, study of the uh, process of organizing, classifying, and naming living things. So we follow the formal system originated by Carl von Linn. Okay. So when we talk about taxonomy, you have to differentiate between classification and identification. Nomenclature is just to assign the name. Okay? Nomenclature is just to give the bacteria the name. But there is a difference between classification and identification. So identification is for practical purpose. Imagine you are working in the food industry and then they say to see whether there is any salmonella in your sample. So that is identification. It's very straightforward. You do not have to worry about other bacteria, how it is connected to other bacteria in an evolutionary sense. Whereas classification, you look at your bacteria and you need to tell people to which group it is related to. Evolutionary, which means in a classification system, you need to place your bacteria within the other bacteria within the same genus and if it's a wider study, even different genus. Okay? So that is classification, which means you need to place a bacteria within the uh, evolutionary context. We say evolutionary context because we are using 16S and we are assuming that that uh, gene changed over time, allowing the different species to diverge. Okay? So when we talk about classification, it is mostly in the terms of evolutionary context. But identification is for practical purposes, whether in the food industry, whether in the hospital. So in the hospitals, people say, is this E. coli? Is this Klebsiella? You know? Very, very specific. Even if in you're in, in the hospital, you isolated a new bacteria, there is no need for you to further identify it or to classify it because that is not your job. Your job is just to see what kind of bacteria causes the disease and what kind of antibiotics works best. And especially now, since there are more and more uh, bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics, that part of the work becomes more and more important. So, know the difference between classification and identification. So for, class, for identification, um, the main characteristics that you use are the morphology, the shapes, uh, the biochemistry, uh, biochemical profile, the physiology. Physiology in the sense that is it motile, is it non-motile, then genetic characteristics. So the importance of microbial taxonomy, now we have a lot of bacteria. So for levels of classification, know that the highest, uh, the highest level of classification is domain, then kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Okay, so this you have to remember, okay, because it will be helpful for you later when you want to know the, the different types of bacteria. So in bacterial taxonomy, it is quite, quite systematic. For order, it always ends with a LES, less. Okay? For family, it always ends with a CA, C-E-A-E. -E. Okay? So when you see it, you know that whether they're talking about order, or family. Phylum, there is a dota at the end, but it is still not fixed yet. Okay? Bacterial taxonomy is ever growing, ever changing. The best place for definitive bacterial name or systematics is this website www.bacteria.net. So this will have all the valid names, the valid bacterial names, the names that are accepted as valid for that species. If it's not valid, it'll also put there, but they'll put there as non-valid. 
So you know which is the name that you should choose for your bacterial species. Okay, so this is the best place. And it is not easy to get a new species. Okay, for bacterial taxonomy to get a new species, you have to publish it in an accepted journal. Uh, these are acronyms. The first one is International Journal of Systematics and Evolutionary Microbiology. The second one is Journal of Bacteriology. And the third one is Journal of Applied Microbiology. Only when you publish in these journals will they accept it. Then, okay, but once you have it, then you have your the genus is capitalized, the species lowercase. Then, you have, for example, Staphylococcus aureus. We use, we use the short form only at the second mention. Okay. So inspiration for names are extremely varied and often imaginative. And from the names also, sometimes you can guess. Guess why is it named like that? For example, as I mentioned, Staphylococcus aureus, coccus, round, staphylo, like a bunch of grapes, aureus, because it forms golden-like colonies on uh, neutron agar, yellow, yellow gold, gold. So here, uh, cell morphology, we'll look at cell morphology. You only saw two types, right? One is the coccus, one is the rod. But you also saw within the rod itself, you have short rods and long rods. Okay, so sometimes people use short rods and they, they name it as cocobacilli. And then they say, uh, they give it a um, taxonomic importance, which means uh, cocobacilli can be used to define the bacteria. So you have spirulum. Uh, spiral kits. Spirulum is uh, helical, spiral, spiral. But spiral kits, it looks like spiral also, but it's actually flattened. So you have budding, uh, budding and appendage bacteria, then filamentous bacteria. Uh, when you look at budding bacteria or appendage bacteria, a lot of times, it depends on the ecology of the bacteria. If it's in a suitable environment, then it will form appendages to attach itself to substrate. Okay? Not, not necessarily, it will form appendages all the time. Only when the situation calls for it. So you have cocci, uh, round, but round you can have cluster, you can have uh, tetrads. Tetrads means four. Micrococcus is usually in tetrad form. Micrococcus. Then you can have uh, in groups of eight, Sarsinia. Then in long chains, Streptococcus. So Streptococcus, Streptobacilli. When they are chained, that's how they name it. For Diplococci, well, Neisseria gonorrhea, their presumptive identification is a diplococci but flattened in the middle. So it's more like a kidney bean shape. Okay? So uh, cell morphology can help you in your identification, but it is never final. It's just presumptive, gives you an idea of what tests to follow up with. Okay? You have bacillus and you have curved. Okay. Vibrio is curved, like a comma shape. Caulobacter is the name, uh, one, one example of appendage bacteria, stocked bacteria. Okay, uh, just for your information, we also have square bacteria. Okay. This one. It's an archaean, so archae bacteria. Halophilic, halophilic, halo is for salts, loving, salt loving. So this one is a hypersaline pool. Hypersaline means the salt concentration is very, very high. Okay? 
Although they discovered it in 1980, which means through microscopy, you see it, but they were only able to culture in 2004. It's hard to culture bacteria. Okay? You try, but sometimes, at, even at the moment, about 95 to 99% of bacteria is still yet to be cultured. Then cell size, of course, prokaryotic cells are small, but sometimes you get very large ones, but very rare. Okay? The largest bacteria now is probably uh, Thio margarita nam namibiensis, found in nam probably Namibia. 750 micron in diameter. So 750 micron in diameter is about 0 0.75 millimeter. So slightly smaller than a millimeter. But if you look at your ruler, you can you can discern one millimeter. So you can probably it, it is observable even without a microscope. Okay, next is on cell membrane. So cell membrane, we'll talk about cytoplasmic membrane first. This is the layer just uh, encapsulating the cytoplasm. It has uh, three major functions. So cell permeability barrier is to prevent the cytoplasm from leaking out to into the environment. Okay. So for, for example here, if it has if it has food, of course it doesn't want the food to go out from its body. Okay. That's why it is a uh, it has a barrier there. The protein anchors is usually for transportation. Here it is because of the nature of the cell membrane itself. The cell membrane is, is a lipid by, by layer membrane. Lipid by layer like this. So you have a hydrophilic region here and a hydrophobic region in the middle. So when you have proteins that anchor inside your cell membrane, so most of the time the function of the protein is for transportation to transport certain solutes into the cytoplasm or sometimes to eject certain things out of its body then finally energy conservation this is more like for the proton motive force to generate ATP okay to generate energy so for prokaryotic cells bacteria and archaea the site for generation of energy is at the uh, cytoplasm, the, the, the location where they generate the ATP is the cytoplasmic membrane, okay? as opposed to eukaryotic cells, right? For eukaryotic cells it is? Uh, yeah. So it's mitochondria, so it's different. For movement of materials across membrane, you have passive and active. Essentially, active means require energy. Passive doesn't require energy. For passive processes, you have simple diffusion. What is the definition of diffusion? High concentration to low concentration. What if the concentration uh, doesn't, doesn't allow for diffusion? Then we need facilitated diffusion where uh, carrier proteins are required to transfer to transport the uh, solutes okay the substances so whenever you need to carry out facilitated diffusion a, a certain amount of energy is usually required next is osmosis this one is based on the water pressure okay, where you have different types hypertonic solution, isotonic and hypotonic solution isotonic when the concentration of solids equals those inside and outside so there's no next net change hypotonic is when the concentration of the solids outside is lower so the amount of water here is more so water goes in, 
and causes the cell to lice. If there is no barrier, so you need cell wall if you do not want the cells to break. Okay? Then the opposite is for hypertonic solution. So look here at active processes. It's an active transport group translocation where energy is required. So the most the, the example shown here is the proton pump where a proton gradient is formed through the work of proton pump in order to generate ATP. Next is cell wall. Because cytoplasmic membrane is not strong enough to prevent lysis, usually bacteria has a cell wall that encapsulates the uh, cytoplasmic membrane. Thus, the cell wall is semi-rigid, okay? so it confers structural strength on the cell to keep it from bursting due to osmotic pressure. So this is the diagrammatic representation of cell wall for gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria. So take note, for gram-positive bacteria, you have a thick peptidoglycan layer. Okay? So this is what holds the so you, if you remember your gram staining, the first the primary stain you apply is your crystal violet. Okay? So that stains the peptidoglycan. Okay, then you add the uh, iodine as a mordant to fix it to hold it better within that peptidoglycan, right? So here you can see that the gram-positive bacteria has a very thick peptidoglycan. It holds the stain well. Whereas the gram-negative has very thin peptidoglycan. That's why when you decolorize with uh, acetone, the stain that is in gram-negative bacteria washes out. But the stain in the gram-positive bacteria still holds. So the final step of a counter-staining with saffronine, it doesn't work on gram-positive because the gram-positive is already purple. So if you counter-stain with red, it doesn't change the color. But for gram-negative, it is at this point colorless because you have decolorized it. So it, it, it is then stained red because of the saffronine. No, what, are, what is the difference between uh, gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria? So a thicker, gram, a thicker peptidoglycan, the presence of tachoic acids in gram-positive bacteria, and the presence of uh, lipopolysaccharides in gram-negative bacteria. Okay. So lipopolysaccharides is important because it is antigenic. A lot of times, it is the LPS region that causes reaction, our body immune system reaction to bacterial infection. Here you can see the lipopolysaccharides have antigens and endotoxin that causes fever and shock. So gram stain mechanism we've covered. Your gram staining, some of you didn't get all purple, right? Certain reasons, there's a few possible reasons. The culture might be old. The old culture doesn't hold the uh, stain well because the integrity of the cell wall is already weakened. Um, it could be dead cells because when you fix the smear, you overheat it. Okay, so that's also a possibility. So next, RK. For RK, it's, although it's prokaryotic, they are very different in the sense that they use, uh, they contain different substances. For example, uh, pseudomurine in place of peptidoglycan. Okay. And RK are usually extremophiles. They like extreme environments, so they have very different uh, components in their cell wall. 
So in our case, we have methanogens, we also have uh, sulfate, sulfate reducing bacteria and all these bacteria plays an important role in the nutrient cycling because uh, these archaea bacteria are able to carry out processes that other bacteria uh, cannot. So atypical cell wall, uh, archaea bacteria has an atypical cell wall but the most important for you to remember will be mycoplasma. Mycoplasma does not have cell walls. Okay? So when you stain, uh, gram staining, it will, be, it will stain red. Next is cytoplasm. Cytoplasm is the one within the cell membrane. It is made up of mostly water, proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and other components. It has uh, inclusions here, uh, ribosomes and chromosome. So for prokaryotic cells, there is no organelles. So that's why you do not have a nucleus, but just strands of chromosome. The inclusion is not considered an organelle because it is just, uh, you can see here that the inclusion is a reserve deposit in the cytoplasm of cells. It can be for buoyancy. So these are all inclusions. You can have inclusions as gas vacuoles. So it's for buoyancy, especially for bacteria uh, living in aquatic environment. You do not want to sink too low. Sometimes uh, they may require light okay, to carry out uh, photosynthesis. So they need to be nearer to the surface. So the buoyancy, the gas vacuoles will help the cells remain in the euphotic zone, the place where there is light. Okay. You also have inclusions with sulfur granules, especially for sulfur bacteria. So this is a sample a photomicrograph of a thiobacillus. If you look under microscope, even without staining, you can see refractive, uh, refractive components, circular refractive. You know, it's refractive because uh, of sulfur. Okay. You can also have lipid inclusions, uh, polymer beta hydroxybutyrate. So. Some researchers will study the formation of polymer beta hydroxybutyrate because this is the basis for uh, biodegradable plastics. Okay? So that they, they look at this and they want to optimize the production of uh, polymer beta hydroxybutyrate okay? as a form of uh, biodegradable plastics. So you can also have magneto magnetosomes, which means there is a magnet-like iron oxide which acts like a magnet inside the gram, inside the bacteria itself. In pro prokaryotes in the cytoplasm, you have nuclei, you have ribosomes and inclusions. So what it is lacking is the cytoskeleton and cytoplasmic streaming. So cytoskeleton and cytoplasmic streaming is in the eukaryotic cytoplasm, but not in prokaryote. Okay. Prokaryote has a cell wall, therefore it doesn't need a cytoskeleton. But eukaryotes don't. Okay, so they need a cytoskeleton to strengthen their structure. So remember in prokaryotes, only a nuclear area with chromosomes, but in eukaryotes you have a nucleus, an organelle. Uh, plasmids, the extracellular genetic elements which we have talked before. Then ribosomes. So ribosomes, remember, 
you, the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic ribosomes. Okay, 70S and 80S made up of these large and small subunits. Then this is the staining of the metachromatic granules in Corini bacterium diphtheria. You can see the granules here. Endospores are resting cells formed by certain gram-positive bacteria, but also gram-negative. Okay, also gram-negative. So I've put, I've listed a few examples: Sporomusa, Coxiella, and Acinetonema. Endospores mostly found in gram-positive bacteria. Okay, because. When I say mostly found in gram-positive bacteria, it's because I'm talking in terms of uh, application, which is when you work in the labs, most of the time, it's the gram-positive bacteria that will form spores. Because when you're talking about gram-negative, you're always looking at enterobacteria CA, or the gram-negatives that do not form spores. Okay? In, for practical purposes, most of the bacteria that you will see, if you work as a microbiologist, will be from gram-positive bacteria. Most common, bacillus, uh, then you have clostridium, most common. Bacillus is aerobic, clostridium anaerobic. Okay? So depending on the kind of uh, how you incubate your culture, if you incubate in an aerobic condition, there is no way you can get clostridium. Clostridium endospores are larger than the cell diameter. That means their endospores will bulge. Okay? For example, this first tree, the endospores bulge. The, which means it's, it's a presumptive of clostridium. Okay. But anoxybacillus also, uh, penibacillus also bulge. But anoxybacillus and penibacillus are rare. Clostridium is more prevalent. Okay. So if, when you do spore staining, if you see uh, endospores that bulge, you know it is not bacillus. Okay? It is not bacillus. Bacillus, the endospores is formed smaller than the cell diameter. Okay? So here, if you look at this photomicrograph, the greenish blue are the endospores. The reddish are the cells. Okay? So this is typical of bacillus because the endospores are small. Here you can see that the endospores are bulging. So this is presumptive for clostridium. So the location of the endospores can be terminal at the end, subterminal or central. So that is the uh, terms that are used. Okay. So endospores are formed when the cells sense that the conditions are not suitable. No longer suitable for growth. So they have to save themselves. They save themselves through the formation of endospores. So that Later on, in the future, when the conditions are suitable, they will, they will germinate and grow again. So it is their way of uh, survival. Okay. What is important is, in the endospores, you have uh, calcium and ions and dipicolinic acids. So this will strengthen the coat of the endospores and it has a DNA, a small amount of RNA, ribosomes, enzymes and a few small important 
molecules. So it doesn't have the full complete set, but just enough for it to germinate and restart when the conditions are right. Okay. Endospores can survive for a long time. Okay, can survive boiling water for several hours. Thermophilic bacteria can survive for 19 hours in boiling water. So this uh, slide shows the formation of the endospores. The formation of endospores begin with uh, DNA replication first. Once they have two pairs of DNA, when they have a pair of DNA, then one chromosome will go to one side and the other. Then you have your spore septum to start with the formation of endospores. So the spore coat contains dipicolinic acids and also calcium ions to strengthen the structure and also to prevent uh, to prevent it from drying out. Okay. Uh, next is flagella. Uh, not all bacteria has flagella. The motile ones have flagella. Okay. So bacteria can swim. So if you look at this, is this a gram positive or gram negative bacteria? Yeah, because there is a lipopolysaccharide layer. The difference between pro prokaryotic and eukaryotic flagella is that the bacterial flagellum is like a propeller, whereas the eukaryotic flagellum is like a whip. But the flat bacterial flagellum is rigid and it just turns like that. We have your FLI proteins. This is the motor switch that changes the direction of the flagella. Whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise. The mod protein is where the energy comes from the motor to run the flagella. Okay. Then the rings are to anchor it to the uh, outer membrane. The L ring is for the outer membrane. The SM ring is for the cytoplasmic membrane and the P ring here. This is for gram-negative bacteria. This is the filament and the filament is composed of flagellin, it's hollow. So when the, 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 the process of flagella formation is interesting because they build it from in out. So the flagellin is transported, it's hollow in the middle. So it's transported out and placed towards the, so it lengthens by that way. The flagellin goes through the hollow tube and is placed at the end. Okay, that's how the bacteria uh, generates the flag filament, the flagella. Okay, so it is unlike the hair on your head because your hair grows at its base but bacterial flagella grows at its tip so it's opposite. Okay, then you have a hook here the hook is solid, so uh, either clockwise or counterclockwise. Your motor here. Your motor has a basal body, and then your stator, which provides the top necessary for rotation. You can see the st the stator has a component, a transmembrane component, goes across the membrane. Why? Because it uses proton motive force to generate the energy. It has to cross the membrane so that it can create the proton gradient. Once the proton gradient is adequate, then it has enough energy to provide the torque to spin the uh, filament. Okay, so, so the rotation is due to the proton motive force. Okay. 
the protons, uh, the, where the protons accumulate on the outside of the cell membrane, driven through the pores in the mod protein. You here, the stator. So the interaction causes the basal body to rotate and turns the filament, the filament extending from the cell. Rotation is at uh, 200 to 1000 rotations per minute. So that is very, very fast and results in speeds of 60 cell lengths per second. So when you compare to a cheetah, it's 25 body lengths per second. So it swims very fast. The bacteria swims all through chemical senses. They can only sense. Bacteria is not one or two. Bacteria is in millions. Even if a few die, the rest can continue survive uh, for the propagation of the DNA propagation of the species so from here you can see the difference between the gram positive and gram negative of flagella as I mentioned gram negative have more extra two rings to to hold it within the uh, outer membrane to hold it in place here you can see uh, the different terms we use depending on where the filament is on the bacteria. If it's a monotrichus, it is a single flagellum at one pole. Lophotrichus is a tuft of flagella, which means a bunch of flagella at one pole. Ampitrichus is two. Okay? Then peritrichus all over the cell, then enphylopotrichus, the tuft of flagella at both ends. So the movement is as uh, the tumble and run, clockwise and counterclockwise. When it's counterclockwise, it runs. When it's clockwise, it tumbles. That means when the flagella is turning clockwise like this. It just rotates, tumble, trying to orient itself and then it runs. Okay, so from here, so it goes to one place, it tumbles, but the overall direction is always towards some chemical attraction. It might, it might look quite haphazard but over the long run you know that it is trying to reach a chemical attractant could be a source of food or, or something else okay so so when it tumbles it is just uh, orientating itself and when it moves straight it is a run okay so clockwise is Tumble, counterclockwise is run. What attracts it? It can be chemical response, chemical stimuli, that's chemotaxis. If it's a light stimulus, it's phototaxis. The photo means light. Chemo is chemical, you can guess from the name. So we also, other than flagella, we also have fimbrae. Filmary and the thin ones, the shorter ones. So the function of flagella in bacteria is to swim. The function of filmary in bacteria is to stick, stick to surfaces, stick to other cells. Then we also have pili that uh, a pili, the function of a pili is usually for conjugation, a sex pili. So the bacteria actually can conjugate. They don't need to, but they can if they want to transfer genetic elements. Okay? If there are some genes that they want to transfer, they can carry out a conjugation. Okay? So, Pili is important as a virulence factor and for pathogenicity.
So this is the eukaryotic flagella in cilia. The most important thing is for eukaryotic, there is a certain position, and long a positioning or arrangement, to 9 plus 2 and 9 plus 0 array. They are so that's the, more, that's the important thing that you should if remember. The projections so for eukaryotic flagella, and short, the positioning of its uh, haze, uh, they are microtubules uh, is in the formation of 9 plus 2 array and 9 plus 0 array. You don't have this in prokaryotic flagella. Then we have capsule and slime layer. You be doing capsule stain also during your practical. Hopefully you can see something like this, where the capsule, uh, where the bacteria is inside the capsule. Substances along the so from here you can see that the capsule kind of protects the bacteria. Okay, it has a function to protect the. Bacteria. So usually, bacteria that has capsules can be pathogenic because if it goes into your body, it can evade your immune system. It can protect itself against the immune system. Then you also have a slime layer that is thinner and less rigid.